In this video, we'll introduce and define context-free grammars. So what is a context-free grammar? In a nutshell, I think the simplest definition is that context-free grammars are recursive regular expressions. When you add recursion to regular expressions, you get a new level in the Chomsky hierarchy. You strictly exceed the expressive power of regular expressions, and you begin to be able to recognize languages with the recursive phrase structure. To motivate context for grammars, let's try to create a regular expression that matches a language of balanced braces. That is, suppose we want a regular expression that can match all of these strings. Left brace followed by right brace, left by left by right by right, left left left, right right right, and so on. It seems like we'd have to have an infinitely long regular expression to capture this, a regex where we consider every possible nesting. But if we're feeling clever, we might try to shortcut this with a couple of repetition operators, one on each brace. In fact, this will match all the strings that I just mentioned, but it will match four more than those. It will also match strings of braces that are not balanced. So this is probably not the best idea. To fix this, we need to allow regular expressions to refer back to itself, uh, or a regular expression to refer back to itself. And in the process, uh, if we do this, what we've really created is context for grammars. So for example, in this expression, uh, S can match a left brace, a matched set of braces, and then a right brace, where a matched set of braces is, of course, the expression itself, or it matches an empty string. This exactly describes the right set of strings that we're looking for. So to go from regular languages, which consist of those strings defined by sequence, union, and repetition, we can replace context-free, uh, or we can replace repetition with recursion, and what we end up with is context-free languages. So take, take repetition, replace it with recursion, recursion, and now you have context-free languages. But have we lost repetition or the cleanly star operation? Is that gone? No, actually, it's, it's still there. Anywhere that we had a cleanly star, we can replace it with a new language. So what we can do is insert a language B, and then we can define B to be exactly what A star meant. In this case, what we can say is that B is now either an A followed by another instance of B, or it's the null string. In this way, B is now an arbitrary long sequence of A's, just as we had intended with A star. So what are the core components of a context-free grammar? We need four things, terminals, non-terminals, productions, and a start symbol. Terminals are a set of atomic symbols. In a compiler, these are tokens coming from the lexer. Non-terminals are the types of phrases. In a compiler, these could be things like statement and expression. And we need productions to define the structure of these phrases. A production is a rule like an expression may be an expression plus an expression. And we need a start symbol to tell us which non-terminal represents the language as a whole. So now let's consider the simple example of the term grammar. This is a pretty common grammar that shows up in examples of context-free grammars. In the term grammar, what we have is a list of productions or rules telling us how to construct proper terms over addition and multiplication. And in this grammar, we can identify the core parts. We have a set of terminal symbols, plus, times, left paren, right paren, and a generic terminal for some number, n. We also have non-terminal symbols. On the left-hand side of each rule, we have a non-terminal. In this grammar, there are three non-terminals, e, t, and f, which we may call expression, term, and factor. And of course, these non-terminals can also appear on the right-hand side. Every rule is itself an individual production. For example, the first rule says that an expression may be a term plus an expression. The second rule says that an expression may be a term. The third rule says that a term may be a factor times a term. The fourth rule says that a term may be a factor. The fifth rule says that a factor may be a left paren, followed by an expression, followed by a right paren. The final rule says that a factor may be a number. And of course, we have the start symbol for this grammar as well. In this case, the start symbol is the expression. That is, the language described by this grammar is the set of expressions. Now let's consider a simple example of illustrating the phrase structure of an expression in this grammar. That is, let's turn a sequence of characters into a tree according to the grammar. So let's consider three plus two. To determine the structure of three plus two according to the grammar, we're going to start applying the rules. First, the numbers are in fact 
factors. And both of those factors can be terms. And a term can also be an expression. All of these assertions are valid under the grammar. And if we see a term, a plus, and then an expression, then that itself is also an expression. So what we've done here is mentally parse the expression according to the grammar.